Hi and welcome to this lecture of common pediatric food deformities. Uh, this is one of the lectures in the pediatric orthopedic part of the orthopedic review series. A good source that you can use is this book, The Guide to Pass Final Orthopedic Exam, written by myself. The first condition which we are going to talk about is the club foot. Sometimes we call it talipus equinovirus. So the club foot, it's a talipus equinovirus in some a textbook. It's a rigid congenital deformity of the foot. So it has to be a rigid deformity. It cannot be flexible uh, deformity. It has to be a rigid congenital deformity of the foot. And that's what we call a club foot or talipus equinovirus. The club foot is a relatively common condition. It happens in 1 in 1,000 live birth, so it is not a rare condition, uh, and uh, 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 most orthopedic surgeons will see this condition, and if you're a pediatric orthopedic, you will definitely treat lots of kids with club foot. It is more in boys than girls. Uh, it's about 2 to 1 boys to girls. 50% of the cases are bilateral, so the kids will present with bilateral club foot, and the condition definitely runs in families. So if you have one sibling affected, the incidence uh, goes from one in a thousand to ten percent, uh, which is basically one, uh, which basically hundred uh, in a thousand. So it is like one hundred more time if you have one sibling affected, and uh, twenty-five percent if one of the sibling and one parent affected. So the condition is fairly common, one in a thousand. More common in boys, two to one. Fifty percent of the cases are bilateral, and it runs in families. So if you have one sibling affected, there is ten percent chance uh, that it will be affecting. Other other siblings and if there is one sibling and one parent it will become 25% what are the types of the club foot? It can be idiopathic, which is most common type of club foot. So most of the cases we see is idiopathic, are, are idiopathic club foot, in which there is no other congenital deformities can be found. So most of the cases are idiopathic. Uh, some of the cases are postural, and the postural cases are not real club foot because these can be easily corrected. So the uh, picture will look like a club foot. The child will come with a picture that looks very similar to club foot, but you, this is not rigid deformity so it's not a real club foot it's a, just a postural club foot um, syndromic club foot is the club foot associated with other congenital anomalies one of the most common causes to cause um, a club foot is arthrogryposis so arthrogryposis is one of the most common condition distal especially if it's a distal arthrogryposis that will have the child presenting with club foot uh, diastrophic dwarfism also present with, uh, with club foot the last type we'd like to talk about is the neuromuscular club foot. Um, uh, Myelomeningocele uh, can have club foot at the uh, birth or shortly after, uh, and cerebral palsy kids develop equinovirus deformity, which is very similar to club foot. So types again are idiopathic, which is the most common, postural, that's not real club foot, syndromic associated with other syndromes, and neuromuscular, uh, mainly uh, myelomeningocele, in which the patient may have have club foot at birth or shortly after and cerebral palsy in which the kid with time will develop an um, equinovirus deformity. Postural club foot, uh, as we said, it looks like exactly like, like the club foot picture. There is equinus, varus, um, uh, four foot a deduction. However, if you hold the foot and you start correcting, you'll be able to reach full correction. Like you see the difference between this foot here and here. All what we did is just um, uh, holding the foot and putting it into the correct position and the foot is uh, supple and it can be corrected. So this is not a real club foot, it's just a postural club foot. Uh, so this is a case, uh, one of my patients uh, uh, presenting uh, with a bilateral club foot. See the left side fully corrected. Um, uh, so this is not a real club foot. We can bring it to full correction. So this is posture, posture the left side, the right side. I'm pushing as hard as I can. I can get it fully corrected. Still in equinus, varus, and then full foot deduction. So right side is a real club foot idiopathic. Left side is posture. So what is the pathology in cases of club foot? It has to be a rigid deformity, as we said. So anything in these deformities has to be a rigid. It cannot be flexible. If it's a flexible, it's a postural club foot. It's not a real club foot. There are four main deformities in the club foot, and you need to remember that 
which is the ankle and foot equinus so there is an equinus as you can see here hind foot varus so if you see the foot from the behind the the uh, um, ankle uh, the, the heel is in varus and four foot adduction so the four foot in relation to the hind foot is adducted towards the midline and the fourth one which is extremely important is cavus of the foot which is high arch um, so this is very important because previously we used to say that there is three main deformity the equinus the hind foot varus and the four foot adduction and we did not talk about cavus now we know that cavus is um, a very uh, um, important part of the pathology an important part to understand in the treatment and what does it mean cavus cavus means for uh, that the first ray is actually uh, um, uh, plantar flexed so uh, the, uh, the 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 cavus foot means that there is a high arch which basically mean uh, plantar flexion of the first ray or an e, uh, e version of the uh, first ray uh, this is um, i know it's hard to understand because we know that the foot is su severely supinated uh, yes uh, but um, uh, if you compare the forefoot to the hind foot um, actually the forefoot is in mild e version in compared to the uh, uh, hind foot so there is um, a, a cavus foot or there is a plantar flexion of the first ray so cavus of the foot um, means high arch foot which basically means a plantar flexion of the first ray or e version of the first ray so the, um, the uh, club foot is a rigid deformity it has four main deformities ankle and foot equinus as you can see here hind foot varus as you can see here four foot a deduction and the last one is cavus which is high arch what does it mean and um, you can see here the crease here indicating the cavus the high arch meaning that the first ray is plantar flexed uh, and, and actually the the forefoot is everted compared to the hind foot um, other uh, cases can be as, uh, have uh, s uh, some associated pathology like internal tibial torsion, uh, small calf muscles, uh, which will be obvious in unilateral cases, uh, shorter leg, um, lower leg compared to the other side because there is um, intrinsic hypoplasia and small foot size. So in, uh, this can obviously be um, uh, detected in the unilateral cases. So in unilateral cases, um, you will always find that uh, the affected foot is a little bit bit smaller than the um, uh, unaffected foot um, uh, in some cases as we said has internal tibial torsion uh, smaller calf muscles and shorter lower leg what is the clinical presentation of club foot we discussed that it has to be a rigid deformity it cannot be fully um, uh, fully uh, corrected um, what you will see you will see equinus uh, of the ankle and the hind foot um, you will see uh, a hind foot varus as you can see here and you will see four foot a deduction meaning the forefoot is a deducted in relation to the hind foot and of course you can see the cavus this uh, high crease here and this high crease here you can see also uh, the high crease here that indicates that there is a very high arch here and the high arch basically means plantar flexion of the first ray or e version of the first ray so what is the management of the club foot we discussed the clinical presentation the pathology the management um, of this uh, patient that you don't need radiographs there is no need to uh, order radiographs of the foot in these cases if you have an idiopathic club foot uh, there is two treatment method uh, uh, the serial casting by the poncetti which is most uh, uh, popular uh, more popular method and uh, there is something called the french method or the physical therapy and stretching um, however this method is not as common uh, uh, common uh, as the Ponsetti and it requires much more resources um, so we're not going to really discuss this method we're going to discuss the serial casting by Ponsetti which is by far the most popular uh, method of treatment of club foot so the serial casting uh, by uh, Ponsetti method um, basically a, a long um, a leg cast why do we do long legs so it does not uh, slide from the child uh, foot um, and it's a um, weekly uh, change of the cast uh, you have to remember that the first cast um, what are you going to do is you basically going to treat the cavus 
so um, what are you going to do is you're going to dorsiflex the first ray or supinate the forefoot um, and you have to uh, sometimes warn the family that the shape of the foot in the first uh, cast will uh, may look a little bit worse because you're going to supinate uh, the forefoot to be in line with the hind foot so it may look a little bit worse than uh, before the cast so the first cast um, is to treat the cavus and um, um, how do we do that we actually dorsiflex the um, first ray or we evert the first ray or all, all these are um, uh, involve the same uh, basically the same maneuver which is you push on the first ray from uh, plantar to dorsal uh, to dorsiflex or evert uh, the first ray um, uh, second third and fourth till you reach the full correction uh, what are you doing is you are um, uh, externally rotating the foot in relation to the um, uh, tailor head so the tailor's head is basically uh, the uh, uh, axis of the rotation and then you externally rotate the foot and when you externally rotate the foot you will uh, correct the uh, hind foot varus uh, and you will only be left with equinus which we will treat at the end if needed uh, so um, the, the first cast is to treat the cavus um, so basically you dorsiflex uh, the first uh, ray sec um, and then after that you're trying to uh, treat the um, uh, hind foot varus and forefoot adduction uh, you um, uh, rotate in relation to the talus um, and this rotation uh, external rotation will correct the hind foot varus uh, after the uh, casting um, and possibly uh, equinus uh, release uh, by tenotomy of the Achilles tendon, uh, the child will be in this form of a brace, a foot abduction orthosis. Um, uh, for uh, uh, two months uh, uh, all, the t uh, all the time, 22 hours, and then after that for 10 hours, which is uh, eight hours at night and two hours in the morning uh, for about two years. Um, uh, compliance with the brace was found to be the most important factor in preventing the recurrence. Uh, families who are not very compliant uh, usually will end having recurrence and need to have further treatment. Um, uh, stretching exercise this is what I told you about or what we call the French method as I to said it requires much more resources because uh, there has to be an, a therapist that will work with the child um, for significant time uh, and uh, it will involve repeated visits um, so it may not be available for all patients uh, however um, it involves the same principle uh, as a stretching and external rotation of the foot to correct the deformity that is present so let's discuss the serial casting in more details as we said it has to be above the knee it cannot be short um, leg uh, y has to go above the knee so that uh, it prevent um, uh, slippage and also in the same time it allows for a more uh, control of the rotation uh, also we said that we uh, externally rotate so the concept of Ponsetti is very easy you externally rotate you have been externally rotated the foot to reach is about 70 degrees uh, and your center of the external rotation is the head of the talus as you can see here so here is the physician putting his um, uh, thumb over the uh, lateral uh, um, head of the talus and then rotating the foot in relation to the lateral head of the talus and the, once you uh, do that external rotation moment you will correct the hind foot uh, varus um, uh, and um, uh, when you reach about 70 degree of external rotation that's when you uh, have reached your correction there is two very important concept of the Ponsetti is never pronate never touch the heel so you should never touch the heel and you should never pronate so what do you do you externally rotate in relation to the lateral head of the talus and you never touch the heel trying to pronate so remember never to pronate never to try to do any inversion it's an external rotation moment and never touch the heel your um, uh, hand uh, is over the lateral head of the talus and then with the other hand you're rotating against the forefoot against that point of uh, axis of rotation and as we said uh, it is long leg cast uh, the knee is involved with, uh, with flexion to prevent slippage and weekly change of the cast 
uh, uh, as we said here, never touch the heel, you touch the lateral uh, um, uh, head of the uh, talus and then you rotate around that. So never pronate, never ever try to, to pronate as this picture uh, because this will actually causes more cavus. We said that this patient has, these patients has cavus. So ba cavus basically mean that the forefoot is pronated in relation to the hind foot. So when you try to pronate the forefoot more, you actually causing more deformity and locking the midfoot and preventing the correction. And this was the uh, mistake that was done uh, in the old methods of correction that it depended on pronation. So never ever pronate in uh, the Ponsetti. You never try to pronate. Why? Because the foot already pronated. Uh, I know it's hard to understand because we know that the foot looks too much supinated. Yes, um, uh, it looks supinated. However, the forefoot in relation to the hind foot is pronated, which basically means that the first ray is plantar flexed. So when you try to pronate more and plantar flex more than the first uh, 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 ray, you're actually creating more cavus and blocking your midfoot joints and blocking any correction. So never to pronate, as you see in this picture, and never touch the heel. All your touch is over the head of the talus, and then you're, pronate, you're externally rotating uh, the uh, forefoot in relation to the uh, uh, head of the talus. Uh, never pronate, never pronate, never touch the heel here or here. What you touch, what you, what you're putting your finger is over the lateral process, lateral head of the talus, and then you're externally rotating. You do not pronate. You're externally rotating in relation to that point. So again, um, we're giving more details on the serial casting by Ponsetti because it's very important. So as we said, in uh, never pronate, never touch the heel. This this is uh, the main concept of uh, Ponsetti. And as we also discussed before, the first cast has a specific uh, idea, which is correcting the cavus. What is cavus means that the first ray is uh, plantar flexed and the forefoot is pronated in relation to the hind foot. Uh, which I, I know it's hard to understand and hard to imagine, but if you look to the mm, forefoot in relation to the hind foot, there's actually pronation of the forefoot in relation to the hind foot. So that's what we give you the cavus. So the first um, casting, you want to correct that. So what are you going to do? You're actually going to elevate, like push up, or we call dorsiflexin, or you can use the word supinate the forefoot. So you want to supinate the forefoot to be in relation to the hind foot, or uh, um, the other description of the same maneuver is your elevating or dorsiflexion. So your elevating here is the first ray or dorsiflexion the first ray, and you can see the 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 cavus which was here is now less. So the first ray, you're doing dorsiflexion, you're doing elevation, you're doing supination. All these expression means the same action, which is pushing up on the first um, ray, pushing on that way um, from plantar to dorsal, so that you can correct the uh, cavus uh, uh, foot. Um, uh, the cast after that, you externally rotate, as we said, and that will correct the for, uh, foot abduction and the hind foot varus. And your goal is to reach about 60 or 70 degree external rotation. Uh, uh, that will, uh, as we said, correct the uh, for foot abduction and the hind foot varus. What is your center? Your center is a, a, a lateral part of the head of the talus. So your center is lateral part of the head of the talus. It's never over the cuboid or calcaneus. It is over the lateral um, head of the talus. Um, and you external rotate, external rotate in relation to the lateral head of the talus. You can see here, uh, first uh, cast, um, uh, what we did is we supinated, we elevated, we dorsiflexed, be, meaning be, basically you push on the first ray from plantar to dorsal to elevate or supinate or dorsiflexion uh, and make the forefoot in line with the hind foot. Now we talk about the equinus. So the equinus is the last component to be addressed. Um, so first thing was the cavus, uh, and then after that, the external rotation, which corrects both the hind foot varus and the, um, the forefoot adduction. And then you assess the patient after you reach about 60 to 70 degree of external rotation. So you were able to reach 60 or 70 degree external rotation, and now you assess the equinus. If you can get about 20 degree of dorsiflexion, uh, and that's enough. If you're not um, able to obtain that amount, 
the uh, Achilles release is done and we don't do Achilles lengthening anymore it's Achilles tenotomy so the pro uh, pr uh, pr procedure now is not Achilles lengthening it's just Achilles tenotomy percutaneous cutting the tendon and, and uh, applying a cast and this cast is different than the previous cast it's not um, uh, one week it's three weeks so again you reach 60 or 70 degree of door uh, of external rotation and then you start assessing the uh, dorsiflexion if you can uh, get 20 degree of dorsiflexion uh, you don't need to do anything uh, however in about 70 to 80 percent of the patient you cannot get that amount of dorsiflexion and you will need percutaneous tenotomy we don't do lengthening anymore we, don't, uh, we do percutaneous tenotomy cut the whole tendon and, and then apply a cast not for one week but for three weeks uh, uh, so the sequence of correction as we said uh, first thing is cavus and then uh, uh, together you correct the forefoot adduction and hind foot varus and the last thing will be the equinus remember the action of uh, neponsetti is external rotation never pronate never touch the heel um, and, and as we said the most important part of determining the recurrence um, uh, uh, after treatment is the um, uh, compliance with the bracing the foot abduction orthosis um, what happens if you present if the patient um, uh, presented uh, with the recurrence uh, in the first three years um, uh, the treatment is another session of serial casting uh, so we tell the family we're going to do serial casting change them weekly uh, and obtain more and more correction till you're satisfied with your correction and um, which basically also still requ um, requires about 60 degree of external rotation um, uh, so uh, the sequence is cavus four foot a deduction and a hind foot varus and then uh, the last thing is the equinus uh, the uh, most important factor in determining the recurrence is the compliance with the brace and if you get a relapse in the first uh, three to four years um, uh, the treatment is by uh, another session of serial casting uh, another specific form of recurrence is called dynamic supination uh, the dynamic supination is uh, when you examine the child the hind foot uh, looks within normal however the forefoot um, uh, has a deduction and we call it dynamic because it's obvious during gait um, so the uh, when the ch child start to walk the hind foot looks okay however the forefoot has a deduction in these cases uh, the treatment is anterior tibial tendon transfer or tbls anterior transfer we know that the bls anterior is inserted into the medial cuneiform so through a small incision this is uh, cut and this is transferred to the uh, la lateral cuneiform and then uh, the the tunnel is um, used to to uh, make in, uh, a drill is used to make a tunnel in the, in the lateral cuneiform the tendon is passed and then in most cases is fixed through a button uh, across the uh, sole of the foot um, about 30 percent of the patient may require this anterior tibial tendon transfer so um, the tibialis anterior transfer or anterior tibial tendon transfer and um, the transfer is from the medial cuneiform to the lateral cuneiform um, um, most people will not transfer to the cuboid because it, it may cause force it eversion so most of the people now uh, transfer to the uh, lateral cuneiform and um, as we uh, said uh, um, there are different methods of fixation however most people will use tunnel uh, in the bone drill and then uh, pass the tendon and then sutured uh, at the bottom of the foot uh, over a, a button um, uh, uh, that's why you need to wait till four or five years uh, where you can see an ossific center of the lateral cuneiform um, so this surgery is done after you can see the uh, ossific center of the bone so it is not done in early age it's done uh, usually at four or five years of age as we said about 30 percent of the patient may need it um, uh, it helps with dynamic supination meaning that when the child walk uh, the hind foot is um, uh, with a normal however uh, the forefoot goes into a deduction so uh, this is a two-year uh, follow-up for one of my patients um, that I did uh, a tibialis anterior tendon transfer for dynamic supination uh, to keep the foot corrected and you can see here when the child walk uh, he has the um, uh, adequate uh, position of the foot uh, um, meaning that there is no forefoot a deduction with gait
Another condition now after we finish the club foot is the metatarsus adductus. The metatarsus adductus um, is a condition in which there is a four foot A deduction. However, it is not club foot. And uh, how do we differentiate it from club foot? By absence of equinus and absence of hind foot varus. So the, there is no hind foot varus um, and there is no equinus. It's only four foot A deduction. And this is metatarsus adductus. Um, it may be related to time in um space. Uh, so th that's why these conditions may be associated with DDH or with um, torticollis. Uh, so these conditions are sometimes associated with tight intrauterine space like um, uh, DDH and torticollis. Um, again, it's not club foot because there is no equinus and there is no hind foot varus. The severity is assessed by a line bisecting the heel. It should be um, around the second uh, uh, toe. Uh, if it's um, in the third toe, that's very mild. If between th the third and fourth, that's moderate. And it is lateral to the uh, uh, fourth. Uh, it is now considered severe. Uh, so in, it should be in the second, uh, if it's lateral to the third, um, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's in the third, it's mild, it's between the third and the fourth, um, it is uh, moderate, uh, if it's after uh, uh, that is the fourth or after, um, it is uh, considered uh, severe. Um, another thing in the clinical presentation is what we call a straight lateral border. So the common foot, um, if you put your index around the lateral border, it, it, you should find a straight border um, parallel to your index. A finger, um, uh, basically the metatarsus adductus has a curved foot uh, and this curve will increase with the severity of the um, uh, 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 condition. Uh, so if you have a straight line here, uh, that's a normal foot. If you have uh, a here, you can see the line is not as straight. Here you can see it is more curved. Uh, and here, of course, if you draw a line or you put your index here, um, uh, you can see the obvious deformity of the foot. Uh, so the uh, lateral border is curved. Uh, you can assess that with your index. If your index is exactly at the lateral border, this is normal foot. Uh, when it's not um, uh, aligned with the full length, that's... Um, uh, 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 tarsus adductus, uh, and again the severity is assessed by line bisecting uh, the heel. It should be uh, in the uh, second. Uh, if it's um, if it mild, it will be in the third. Um, uh, between third and fourth is moderate, and then uh, fourth or lateral to the fourth, that's considered a severe case. So, what is the treatment of metatarsus adductus? It depends on the condition. If the uh, uh, foot uh, condition is flexible, uh, uh, the treatment is observation. However, if the child is one year old um, and the deformity is rigid, uh, it has to be treated. So either a serial casting or braces. Um, so again, for younger children uh, with uh, flexible deformity, no treatment is needed. If that uh, age uh, is one year old, um, uh, if the child is more than one year old uh, and the deformity is rigid, um, the treatment is either serial casting or uh, bracing. Um, uh, surgery is rarely indicated um, if there is failure of casting um, and the surgery will be either uh, release of the capsule um, uh, in young kids um, between two and four uh, or osteotomy if the child is uh, older than four years. So the treatment is observation for uh, small kids with flexible deformity. If the deformity is rigid, the treatment is cast or brace. Um, a surgery is rarely indicated if there is failure of serial casting and the surgery is either um, a capsulotomy uh, or capsular release for young uh, children or it's osteotomies for older children. So if you get a scenario three-year-old with a severe metatarsal and rigid, so it will tell you it's a three-year-old, it's a severe, it's rigid, what's the treatment? It is serial casting, it's not surgery. So a surgery only after failure of serial casting. So this is one of my patient here. You can see more or less normal left side. The right side has metatarsus adductus. Um, uh, this patient is one of my patient, around five year old. Um, and you can see, of course, the forefoot here is um, adducted in relation to the hind foot. There is no equinus. There is no uh, hind foot varus. So this is not uh, club foot. It is uh, rigid metatarsus adductus in a five year old boy. Um, uh, you can see what I told you about the street 
straight lateral border so here if you if you draw a straight line uh, you'll find that the uh, anterior part here is not involved in that line so here you draw a straight line here over the foot uh, and you can see it is not including that anterior part of the foot um, so uh, this is curved lateral border uh, rigid deformity child is five year old and you can see the x-ray here so the x-ray here of the left side um, more or less aligned with the hind foot um, you can see here the, the uh, this is the hind foot alignment and this is the forefoot alignment severe deformity um, uh, uh, indicative of severe rigid um, uh, metatarsus adductus so here is the alignment of the forefoot here is the alignment of the hind foot and there is a big angle between them uh, in contrast to in contrast to the left side here the hind the uh, hind foot alignment and the forefoot alignment are more or less parallel so because this patient um, uh, was basically uh, older patient so a capsulotomy by itself is not uh, uh, enough uh, so what we did is we did osteotomy of the uh, second third and fourth metatarsal and we did a uh, capsular release um, uh, of the um, navicular cuneiform and uh, cuneiform metatarsal um, into the first ray so we did soft tissue release in the first ray and then we did osteotomies you can see here we did soft tissue release and we did the osteotomies we moved the foot uh, forefoot laterally and we fixed it preliminary with a k-wire and you can see here uh, the uh, alignment uh, 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 this is the normal left side which is this side and this is the right side after it healed uh, you can see the alignment is much better the first ray now is aligned with the uh, hind foot and you can see the evidence of osteotomy here um, so this is actually two year follow-up you can see the whole all the metatarsal uh, osteotomies has healed and the first ray is aligned with the uh, uh, talus which is the hind foot uh, so again uh, this is the uh, uh, relatively good left side the right side severe metatarsus adductus and the second third and fourth uh, metatarsal osteotomy uh, on the first ray and um, we did release uh, of the um, navicular um, uh, cuneiform and the cuneiform first metatarsal fix it preliminary with the k wire and you can see here uh, two year follow up um, or one and a half year follow up uh, full healing of all the osteotomies and that the fir first ray is aligned with the hind foot so now we're going to speak about uh, another uh, condition which is tarsal coalition tarsal coalition is abnormal correction uh, connection or bridging between uh, two tarsal bone uh, the condition will start as a fibrous or cartilaginous connection and then it will mature to become bony connection at the age of adolescence so tarsal coalition it's abnormal connection between tarsal bone starts fibrous or cartilaginous and then matures to bony instance is actually common condition it's a five percent of the population however um, it is uh, asymptomatic in most uh, patient uh, it can be transmitted with uh, autosomal dominant uh, transmission uh, and the most common uh, uh, coalition is between the calcaneus and navicular which is the calcaneo navicular and the subtalar which is the telocalcaneal uh, um, uh, coalition so uh, tarsal coalition it's an abnormal connection between the two uh, tarsal bone it starts with fibrous uh, cartilaginous and then it becomes mature to bony the instance is a five percent in the population however most cases are asymptomatic and bilaterally uh, and the condition can actually be transmitted by autosomal dominant transmission um, a most uh, common tarsal coalition is calcaneo navicular between the calcaneus and the navicular and, uh, or the subtalar which is between the talus and calcaneus yes. so it's either calcaneo navicular between the calcaneus and the navicular or subtalar which is telocalcaneal fusion so tarsal coalition and um, as we said it's abnormal connection of the tarsal bone sometimes referred to as failure of segmentation of tarsal bone um, common to present in children between 10 uh, and 14 years of age um, and the clinical presentation uh, actually most patients are asymptomatic uh, and the, you will discover that uh, coalition accidentally um, if you get an x-rays um, uh, or cat scan or mri for other reasons uh, some of the patient will have hind foot pain uh, the source of this pain is not really understood but some of the patients will complain of hind uh, um, foot pain and uh, 
uh, also repeated ankle sprain that's very important um, and we're going to uh, go uh, um, on this multiple uh, times uh, why because it's important in clinical uh, uh, scenarios and in uh, in your practice if you have a patient a adolescent patient with um, repeated ankle sprain think of one of two conditions either cavus foot or tarsal coalition um, the cavus foot because it puts stress on the lateral ligament um, uh, uh, and tarsal coalition because it makes the foot stiff and uh, vulnerable to um, repeated sprain um, you will find decreased subtalar motion this is the most important thing in your exam uh, decreased subtalar motion and um, we're going to see some videos for that and um, uh, these condition commonly associated with uh, fixed vulgus deformity so it's not flexible um, flat foot it's a fixed vulgus deformity in, in uh, most of these cases so you'll find the patient presenting with um, a, a flat foot and when you try to do their motion uh, you'll find that they are not uh, supple they're not flexible uh, it's a fixed uh, deformity and um, uh, also there may be spastic peroneal muscle um, uh, which means that uh, on the lateral aspect of the ankle you'll find the peroneal muscle is spastic um, and we're going to uh, talk about this in the next slide so again for the clinical presentation of tarsal coalition we said stiff flat foot with foot pain so we said there is a hind foot pain we said most of the cases has a flat foot and we said the most important thing is the stiffness In this foot when you if it's unilateral condition and you compare it with the other side you will find severely limited subtalar motion so stiff flat foot with foot pain so it's a stiff flat foot it's not flexible flat foot as the um, most of the flat foot you will see in the office patients have a very flexible uh, foot this one will be stiff uh, and, and um, there will be foot pain and as we said that hind foot pain that um, uh, we don't know exactly what is the source of this pain so you have a stiff uh, it's very limited range of motion flat foot most of the cases associated with the flat foot with foot pain and uh, we discussed before the recurrent ankle sprain uh, and why is that because the foot is um, stiff uh, it, um, uh, it, uh, sub it is more uh, uh, liable to get um, a recurrent uh, ankle sprain or sometimes persistence of the ankle pain after the injury as we said there is very limited range of motion uh, of the subtalar very limited supination and pronation and we talked about uh, peroneal spastic um, uh, flat foot this is the old name for the uh, tarsal coalition uh, on the lateral side of uh, the uh, ankle you will find the peroneal nerve uh, tight and spastic and painful and that was the uh, old name uh, of the um, a tarsal coalition and as peroneal spastic flat foot uh, flat foot the peroneal uh, tendons are spastic and tender and they're trying to stabilize the foot so um, again very important recurrent ankle sprain think of mild uh, uh, cavus deformity or uh, think of a tarsal coalition so this is a picture here you can see this patient has a flat foot on the uh, right side left uh, side looks normal uh, you see the x-ray this is the uh, telonavicular uh, uh, um, uh, this is the calcaneo navicular between the calcaneus here and the navicular and you can see it in the of course in the oblique um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, connection here the abnormal connection between the navicular bone and the uh, calcaneus bone in the lateral uh, you will see what's called the anteater sign and we're going to speak about that in detail so again in the clinical presentation it's a, a stiff flat foot with foot pain um, there is very limited subtalar motion the peroneal tendons are spastic sometimes we call it a spastic a peroneal, a, a peroneal spastic flat foot it's a, a not flexible deformity it's a stiff uh, and there is a recurrent ankle sprain also we discussed in the clinical presentation the onset usually between 10 and 14 and as we're going to um, uh, mention usually the uh, uh, calcaneo navicular starts around the age of 10 to 11 and the subtalar which is the uh, uh, telocalcaneal is about the age of 14 years old and that's the age when the tarsal um, uh, coalition is developing and it is um, um, changing from um, fibrous uh, to cartilaginous to bony um, and that's why uh, the foot starts 
start to become more stiff and the patient start to have more symptoms here this x-ray we're going to speak about that in details this is the c sign this is uh, the lateral view of the uh, subtalar fusion and of course if you get a ct uh, or an mri you will see the um, fusion here so as I told you, I'm going to show you a video for the um, stiffness in the uh, flat foot um, uh, in the uh, uh, um, uh, tarsal coalition. Uh, so you see here very limited subtalar motion. I'm trying to move the foot of the patient very limited. See here uh, full supination, full pronation, full supination, full pronation. Here um, uh, it is very limited subtalar motion, and this is the most important finding that you will see in the exam of this patient. Very limited supination, pronation, very limited subtalar motion compared to the other side. Regarding the imaging for uh, um, a tarsal coalition, there is two types of uh, tarsal coalition. Uh, the calcaneo navicular between the calcaneus and the navicular and the, the telocalcanear or the subtalar coalition. Uh, the calcaneo navicular, as you can see here, it can be easily seen in the oblique view, uh, the uh, connection between the navicular and the calcaneus, and also here in the oblique view between the calcaneus and the navicular. In the lateral view, you will see what we call the anteater sign. It means the, um, the prominence here of the anterior process of the calcaneus. Uh, and this is in the lateral view. In the oblique view, you should be able to relatively see the connection easily. The subtalar view is the one which is a little bit harder to see in the uh, radiographs. Uh, there is uh, the C sign, as you can see here. Uh, the uh, talus continuation of the talus will give you uh, what is known as the C sign. Um, uh, however, it's more obvious in CT or MRI, which you can see here uh, the connection between the talus bone and the calcaneus bone. You can see the connection here. So two types, calcaneo navicular between calcaneus and navicular. This is easily seen in the radiograph, especially the oblique. In the anterior, you will see the anteater sign. The subtalar between the talus and the calcaneus, and this in the lateral view, you can see the, uh, the C sign and in the CAT scan or the MRI, you can see obviously here the connection. And if you see here, um, it's obviously that this patient is presenting, as we said, with the vulgus feed. There is a, um, or um, what we uh, if the flat foot or pace planus, you can see here the loss of arch. So here is another patient, uh, uh, one of my patients. You can see here a uh, very obvious C signs of the telus here, uh, a very obvious uh, loss of arch and vulgus feed. And the uh, uh, MRI here, this is not a CAT scan, this is an MRI. You can see the obvious connection between the telus bone here and the calcaneus. You can see the obvious connection in between them. So what is the treatment of tarsal coalition? If the condition uh, is discovered accidentally, there is no treatment needed. If the patient is presenting with pain, then any, uh, initial treatment is immobilization, either casting or cam boot. If this fails to control the symptoms, uh, um, the treatment is by uh, surgery. And I'm going to speak about what are the surgeries for the tarsal coalition. So what is the surgical treatment of tarsal coalition? If this is a calcaneo navicular coalition, a, a coalition between a calcaneus and the navicular, the treatment is excision of that coalition. If it's a subtalar uh, coalition, we do a CAT scan and we assess uh, the amount of uh, coalition in the posterior subtalar um, joint. If, it, if it involves more than 50%, the treatment is fusion. If it involves less than 50%, the treatment is excision of coalition. So calcaneo navicular is always excision of coalition. If it's a subtalar, we do a CAT scan. If the coalition is more than 50%, the treatment is fusion. If the coalition is less than 50%, the treatment is excision of the coalition. Um, as we said before, um, most of these cases are associated with vulgus deformity. If this vulgus deformity is significant, uh, there will be some surgeon that will recommend concomitant uh, correction of the deformity, either by lengthening osteotomy of the calcaneus or displacement osteotomy. 
However, other uh, uh, surgeons will not um, recommend this. Uh, this is um, because that uh, with uh, excision of the coalition, you'd like the patient to move quickly so that they do not develop another coalition. Uh, and if you do an osteotomy, uh, one of the prerequisite uh, of the osteotomy is that you will put them in a cast. Uh, so um, some uh, surgeons will prefer to delay this uh, so that uh, the patient can regain the range of motion after the tarsal coalition and then later on do uh, the correction of the vulgus deformity. Uh, myself, I, I, uh, I prefer that uh, second option. I don't do uh, a concomitant um, excision of coalition and correction of the deformity uh, because I'd like for my patients to get their uh, full range of motion after tarsal coalition and then if needed later on we can always proceed with the correction of the uh, foot deformity. So here, uh, this is uh, one of my patients uh, for removal of tarsal coalition. Um, you can see here, uh, uh, before we did the surgery, uh, this is the uh, uh, very limited range of motion um, before the surgery. And you can see here after surgery, um, the amount of uh, sub uh, subtalar motion um, uh, that this patient had after the tarsal coalition. Uh, compare that with the very limited range of motion before we do the surgery here. So for excision of subteral coalition, it's a medial incision. You can see here we removed up to 15 millimeter to reach to the healthy joint. Uh, through that medial incision, um, a classical incision is between the flexor digitorum and the flexor hallucis is longus because this uh, this crossing between the flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis is longus is the master knot of Henry, which is over the anatomic um, uh, uh, subtalar joint. Um, however, uh, uh, most surgeons will uh, prefer to go actually between the tibialis posterior muscle and the flexor digitorum so you can use the flexor digitorum to protect the bundle. Uh, so classically uh, the uh, approach is between the flexor digitorum and the flexor halluses uh, because this um, uh, crossing is actually over the, um, the subtalar joint is the master node of Henry um, however um, as I said um, as, uh, most surgeons will uh, require uh, will I'm sorry will uh, will prefer to go between the tibialis posterior uh, and the flexor uh, digi digitorum because uh, you can uh, retract the flexor digitorum plantarly and use it to protect uh, the neurovascular bundle. So this is also one of uh, my patient here, uh, subtalar coalition. You can see the amount here. It does not involve more than 50% of the posterior subtalar. So in this case, the decision was taken for excision of the coalition. You can see here before the surgery, very, very limited range of motion um, of the subtalar joint. And here after the surgery, you can see here we did a medial incision. We removed this part. And you can see the amount of the subtalar motion um, okay. and yeah, uh, that's why um, um, if this patient has uh, any form of the um, the deformity that needs to okay. be uh, fixed, I don't do it in the same time because I'd like them to um, be fully um, range of motion after the surgery so that uh, they do not reform the coalition. Thank you for listening and I hope this lecture was beneficial for you.